shift gears. In fact, we're going to completely uh, shift fields here. Um, but there are some chemicals involved in this talk. Uh, they are somewhat simpler uh, than what Ryan was just talking about. So I'm going to talk about the user cryogenics that we use here at the DC field facility. I'll give you some of the fundamental background in it. Um, but I'll also give you some references if you want to delve deeper into how all these things work and what, what the basis is behind them. So first, we're going to talk about helium, the little atom that could. That underlies all the cryogenics that we do here. That, to me, is the single most important element that we have in the periodic table. Because without it, a lot of the physics research that's done in this facility would not happen, period. Um, we'll talk how do you get to low temperatures using helium. Some, some of the cryogenic sample environments we have here at the Magnet Lab, there's a variety because there's a variety of research that goes on and everybody has, every experiment has slightly different requirements. We're going to talk about getting the experiment cold and then keeping it cold in high fields. So contrary to popular opinion, high fields do not make everything better. A lot of times things get much more difficult as you go to higher and higher fields. Like Ryan was saying, you think you've got one peak, then you've got three. We think we can keep it cold, but suddenly we find out something we didn't know, and everything goes to hell in a handbasket. So safety. Um, half joking, don't turn your thesis into an IED. There's a tremendous amount of stored energy in cryogenic liquids. And then thermometry options. You'd be amazed at the number of people who do an experiment and say, oh, you know, the temperature's not really important. Um, for some experiments, that's true. For a lot of experiments, knowing the temperature is critical because that determines the physics that's going on. And then thoughts on basic probe design. So as experimentalists, at some point in your career, you should be building something, right? If you don't build something and fail, you don't understand how it worked. If you build it and it was a success, huzzah, you're going to pat yourself on the back. But chances are you really don't understand how that worked because it worked the first time. So having things work the first time is not all it's cracked up to be. So helium-4. So how do we get helium-4? It's a product of radioactive decay in the Earth's crust. Um, it comes from natural gas wells. In the western United States, a natural gas well that has a good concentration of helium sits at about 3 to 7 percent. So we're not talking about a lot of helium in the gas. So if you look at a map of the United States, here's Colorado, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Texas. So the major uh, Helium-containing gas fields are here. This is the Department of Interior storage facility, Cliffside. Um, that, I think, is located right there. So all these fields are connected via a pipeline to this facility. This facility stores crude helium underground in salt domes. So basically, they just keep pushing this underground with very large pumps to increase the pressure and store the gas. So it's a really great way to store a lot of gas, but as you can imagine, Rock is not helium tight, OK? If any of you have ever made something trying to make it helium leak tight, you can know how difficult that is. So over time, this gas is just eventually going back out into the rock. It's not at a huge rate, but there is some uh, loss there. So helium is lighter than air, shocking. But it, we have a continuous trail of helium behind the Earth in orbit. Once it goes into the atmosphere, it's gone. This is not a renewable resource. Once we exhaust the helium in these fields, we've got nothing. That's it. So recycling helium is absolutely critical. So back in 2013, the, uh, the cliffside uh, unit reached its uh, congressionally mandated limits, both in terms of recovering costs and in terms of volume. So by law, it had to shut down the way Congress wrote the rules. So they actually shut that facility down and pink slipped all the employees. And that's why the price of helium went from about $4 a liquid liter to $15, $20 to you can't get it at universities. So fortunately, cooler heads, or actually smarter heads prevailed, convinced Congress to rewrite the law to open this back up. But in about five years, they will reach their minimum volume where they can no longer operate. So the price is going to keep going up, up, up. And what they're trying to do right now with the private producers is bring them online. And in order for them to come online, the price has to go up. They cannot compete with the government at $4 a liquid liter for helium. The price actually needs to be around $7 to $10 
a liquid leader in order to make it financially reasonable for them to do this. So what that means is that if you're doing any kind of research that uses liquid helium, plan on the cost being 10 to $15 per liquid liter in the future, right? So that means you have to recover helium. If you're at a university, they need to go out and get back into the liquefier business. You're gonna have to have people who run this stuff so you can do your research. That's just the way it's gonna be. That's a fact of life. The days of cheap helium are behind us. So like I said, recover helium. Um, if you see little kids with helium balloons for their birthday party, just snatch them. <laughs> take, take them back to your university and stuff them in the, in the recovery system. I mean, I, I think a little crying is worth it for science, right? I mean, come on. So let's talk about helium-3. So helium-3 is an isotope. There's one less uh, neutron in the nucleus. Um, and it's a product of the radioactive decay of tritium. So it has a very, very, very small abundance in nature. Um, so it's very expensive. Um, not something you want to use in a balloon. This would be the world's most expensive five-year-old birthday party. Um, so the supply of helium-3 in the United States comes from nuclear weapons, right? Tritium is used in fusion bombs to boost the reaction. Over time, about the half-life is about seven years, the tritium decays to helium-3. Helium-3 actually damps the nuclear reaction, so periodically they go in and do maintenance on these warheads, pull the old gas off, put new gas on, but they keep that gas, and then you can separate the tritium from the helium-3, and then we turn the tritium back to the warheads and bring the helium-3 out for other uses. So for years, the United States, um, the D Department of Energy was selling helium-3 um, through EG&G Mound out in Oak Ridge. Um, after the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and then other treaties limiting the number of warheads, it was realized that you could look at the amount of helium-3 being sold, do a backward calculation, determine the number of warheads you had. So they said, we're no longer selling helium-3. Boom, the price spikes up. It went from about $100 to a very, very high price of about $640 to $680 per liter of gas, STP, right? So let's look at helium at low temperatures. So helium-4, if you condense it at an atmosphere of pressure, 1020 millibar, you have a temperature of 4.2 Kelvin. If you put a vacuum pump on it, and get down to about 4.7 millibar, you can pretty easily get down to about 1.5 Kelvin. The theoretical limit of helium-4 at low pressure is about 900 millikelvin. You need a vacuum pump about a quarter of the size of this room to do that in a very well-designed system. But here at the lab, you know, getting 1.5 Kelvin is like falling off a log. Helium-3, if you condense it at 200 millibar, you get a temperature of 2 Kelvin. If you put a vacuum pump on it, you can pretty easily get down to 360, or actually 400 millikelvin here, at uh, 0.036 millibar. So as I said, helium-4 here at the lab, because we have a liquefier, costs about $5.60 per liter of liquid. Helium-3, so $640 a liter for gas, if you want a liter of liquid, that's about $430,000. So we, we don't deal in liters of liquid of helium-3. So now that you're making things cold, you have to keep them cold. And how do we do that? So James Dewar invents the vacuum flask in 1892 as part of his effort to liquefy what were known as the permanent gases. So this is James Dewar right here, peering you know, into his experiment. This is a Dewar flask, what's hard to tell from the picture there's actually two walls here. So you have an outer wall that's transparent of glass and then an inner wall that's silvered to reflect the infrared radiation back out. So it's essentially a vacuum flask by another name, which is the same as a thermos bottle that you'd use to keep your coffee hot, keep your drinks cold. So what would have helped James Dewar are some safety glasses. <laughs> the reason being glass vacuum flasks while you know, glass is a very good thermal isolator, it's obviously very fragile, they can and do implode, and when they initially implode, they then explode, showering you with glass fragments and other things. Um, of course, this never happened to James Dewar, but a couple of his laboratory assistants lost their eyesight because these things imploded and blinded them. So if you have one of these in your lab, please use caution in using them. Wear safety glasses, wear gloves when handling them, because they can just let go on you, right? They seem very stable and they seem very durable, but that does happen. 
So in honor of this invention, the vacuum insulated cryogenic containers are called doers. Um, and apparently he's not related to the family that makes scotch. So how important is vacuum as an insulator? So I think one of the talks, uh, the infrared, cosmic uh, microwave uh, background, the surface temperature of the sun is about 6,000 Kelvin, okay? So this is a uh, picture of our friend there. Uh, room temperature is about 300 Kelvin. Uh, the lowest temperature we can get at the mag lab is seven millikelvin, pretty cold. Uh, there is a factor of 9.8 between 300 Kelvin and 6,000 Kelvin between us and the surface of the sun. There's a factor of 41,000 between room temperature and seven millikelvin. So imagine opening your front door in the morning and the sun is parked right outside your door. That's what you're doing with an ultra low temperature experiment. We're just inches away, you have 300 Kelvin, you're maintaining seven millikelvin uh, over just the space of a few inches. So I can't overstate the importance of vacuum insulation in a cryogenic apparatus. So let's give an example of one of these doers that we would use in the resistive magnets at the lab. So the first part is what we call the outer vacuum can. That's the outermost thing here. That provides the vacuum insulation from 300 Kelvin. And then next, you see your nitrogen space. There's a thing called multi-layer, AKA super insulation, that's wrapped repeatedly around this space. Each of those layers is like the mirroring on the glass for that doer that I showed you, that James Dewar was holding up. So every time you hit one of those layers, it successively reduces the black body radiation coming in from outside. So the more layers you have, the less radiation on the cold surfaces. The downside is the more layers you have, the longer it takes to pump this thing out because now you have square meter, square meter, square meter of all of this surface area that stuff wants to stick to. So then to get a really good vacuum, you have to pump and pump and pump and pump. So liquid nitrogen here, since liquid nitrogen has a very high heat capacity, it's similar to that of water and it's very inexpensive. It's about the same cost as beer. We use that to have a first stage of cooling um, to take us to 77 Kelvin. So this provides a shield around all the helium space. And then we attach to the neck of the four Kelvin space here to intercept the conductive heat traveling down this neck and drop the temperature there. And then the long neck reduces the heat load. If you have an experiment and you have to make this neck short, you're gonna pay the price with boil off from the liquid helium. That's just thermodynamics. Never put helium gas into the OVC deliberately. You can have a leak, you can leak liquid helium in there. It's gonna take a long time to clean up. But if you ever need to warm one of these things up quickly, use dry nitrogen gas. That's the easiest thing to pump back out. Helium gas is gonna stick to that super insulation and you're gonna be kicking yourself for months. Even though you can pump it down to a low temperature, you cool the thing down, that helium still keeps moving around in there. And if it's moving around, it's carrying heat, which increases your boil off and it can cause all sorts of squirrely issues, especially down here at field center where the distance between 300K and 4K is very short. So the shorter the distance between the two, those atoms are bouncing back and forth and they're carrying heat, which will become obvious later when I talk about our helium bubble problem. So one of the ways that we produce low temperatures for users in the high field magnets is what's called a variable temperature insert or VTI. This can get us from at one and a half Kelvin to 300 Kelvin. So we control the sample temperature by controlling what's called the evaporator. So what we do is this is the bottom of our tail of the doer I was just showing you. So this is all liquid helium. So you have a valve. We draw liquid helium from the bath. We put it through this evaporator, which is a big chunk of copper with a plug of centered bronze in there. And around that chunk of copper, we wrap a pretty ginormous 25 or 50 watt heater. And we put a thermometer on there to control the temperature of this metal. By putting a vacuum pump up here, we draw liquid helium through and we create a spray of temperature controlled helium gas. So this works very well. It changes temperature very quickly. It has a broad temperature range. So there are a lot of physics experiments that one and a half Kelvin is plenty cold. And this gives you access to a wide range of temperatures. It's very easy to use. It's very forgiving. If you screw something up, we pull this thing out, we warm it up, we put it back in, you're running the same day, right? You don't worry about losing helium three. You don't worry about unbalancing mixture in a dill fridge. Um, this is the easiest way to do some of the low temperature research. But let's say you need to go colder, you wanna to get to lower temperatures, say 0.3 Kelvin. So we have a helium three system. 
the way this works, instead of having an external vacuum pump, which will limit your ultimate pumping speed, if you can put your vacuum pump at low temperatures and move it very close to where your liquid is, your pumping speed goes up greatly because you've decreased the distance and you're moving very cold gas. So cold gas is dense, you can move a higher mass flow, you get a higher pumping speed. So if we have an external vacuum pump for this, we can get about half a Kelvin. If you put a, a chunk of charcoal in here, which literally is charcoal, I'm not joking when I say Kingsford, you can make one of these things, don't get the match light, right? The match light <laughs> is not gonna work because it's coated with uh, lighter fluid. But you can bust these things up, put them in a container, and this will act as a vacuum pump. At four Kelvin, uh, charcoal pumps everything. Everything sticks to it, adsorbs to its surface. So it's one of the best vacuum pumps on the planet once you get it cold. So we have a probe that loads from the top, your sample holder's on the bottom, you warm up the charcoal sorb here to 40 Kelvin, it releases all its helium-3 gas. It's like taking a sponge soaked with water and squeezing it, everything comes out, it drips into the bottom, it condenses on our 1K pot, and then it fills up around your sample. You then cool this back down, it turns back into a vacuum pump. The temperature goes from 1.5 Kelvin to 0.3 Kelvin. Now your sample's cold, you can do your experiment um, for easily a shift. These systems will hold for two and a half days with just about 15 cc's of helium-3 down at the bottom, depending on the heat load. If you have a higher heat load, your hold time is shorter. And I'll go into some of the pitfalls with this later on. So that's harder to use, but easier than a dilution refrigerator. So if your research requires lower temperatures, you're gonna have to use a dilution refrigerator. So how does a dilution refrigerator work? So if I mix helium-3 and helium-4, condense it into a liquid, it's homogeneous. So it's like looking at a gallon of 2% milk. You know there's 2% milk in there and 98% water, but looking at it, you can't tell the difference, right? So above 850 millikelvin, we get this homogeneous mixture represented by this wonderful color that I picked out. That's so lovely. So if I cool this below 0.85 Kelvin, depending on concentration, uh, there's a phase separation that occurs, like when you start forming ice in water. So ice floats because why? Why does ice float? It's less dense. So helium-3 is lighter than helium-4, so it's gonna float on top of the helium-4. So you can end up with 100% helium-3 floating on top of about 90% helium-4 plus 10% helium-3. And this is where nature actually does us a favor. I know it's hard to believe. So with a dilution refrigerator, there are two very important quantities that if they didn't exist, these would not work at all. So even at absolute zero, I can always dissolve 6.4% helium-3 into this helium-4. Let's say at 50 millikelvin, this went to zero. What do you think my base temperature would be? What's the lowest temperature I could get to? So somewhere north of 50 millikelvin, probably 100 millikelvin because you're always leaking heat into the system. So the reason these things can get down to about two and a half millikelvin in the best case scenario is because at absolute zero, you can dissolve this much helium-3 into the helium-4. It acts as a solvent. So this is the phase diagram. This is actually called the lambda curve. So this shows, depending where you are on your concentration, where you will get phase separation. And on different dilution refrigerators, depending on their geometry, they'll have different initial concentrations. So on one fridge, you may phase separate here at a lower temperature, you may phase separate at a higher temperature, but it's all the same physics. It doesn't mean that it's broke, it's just a function of the geometry of the system. So now that we've separated it and we've got helium-3 in the lower phase here, how do I make this a continuous refrigerator? So, if I can go in and pull these helium-3 atoms out of the lower phase, because nature wants to keep this, this uh, amount of dissolved helium-3 in there, helium-3 atoms from the upper phase are gonna move across that phase boundary to take their place. In order to do that, they have to absorb heat. So just like when you're sweating, in order for the liquid to turn to gas, what does it have to do? Why do you get cold? Why does, it, why does sweat cool you off? takes heat from your body. It's exactly the same process, but it's quantum mechanical instead of traditional Newtonian physics. So this is an upside down evaporator. So the lowest temperature ever recorded with a dilution refrigerator, as I said, 
is 2.5 millikelvin. So we've got a animation here. There we go. And it works. So the first thing you do is you start the 1K pot. So this is what we're going to use to condense the mixture. So this part is running at 1.5 Kelvin. Next, we're going to introduce the gas through the still. The gas now becomes a liquid, right? Drip, 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 drip. It's filling up. This is my homogeneous mixture of helium-3 and helium-4. Now I turn this on, the vacuum pump, and I start pumping the vapor around. But it's a closed system, so I'm going to recondense it here at the 1K pot. It goes through a flow impedance to keep the pressure high, and then it's re-injected in the mixing chamber. As I get below 850 millikelvin, I get my phase separation. But now, with the still, I'm boiling away helium-3. So this is the other time that nature is actually kind to us. The vapor pressure of helium-3 at about 850 millikelvin is 100 times greater than helium-4. So that means if I have a vacuum pump here, I'm pumping 99% helium-3, and the helium-4 stays put. So you, in a properly working dilution refrigerator, you're just circulating helium-3. The helium-4 stays put, and it'll run continuously as long as you keep electricity going in the pumps, and as long as you keep liquid helium surrounding the inner vacuum can. And so this is the other important part, is the inner vacuum can, because the heat load from 4K onto 7 millikelvin is tremendous. So you've got to shield yourself from that as well. Any questions on this? Yeah? So you pull the heat out of the, the sample phase at the bottom. Where does the heat end up going? Where does the heat? So you're actually, so since you're boiling here, you're actually pulling it out there. Okay, that's, that's what I mean. That's right. And again, this is not the traditional evaporation that you have uh, with water. So this is quantum mechanics. So it's moving across, absorbing heat, you're then pulling it across, and it's that motion across the phase boundary that's providing your continuous cooling. So now that I've produced low temperatures, how do you get your experiment cold? So at low temperatures, heat is transmitted through two possible channels, um, conduction electrons. So high conductivity materials also move a lot of heat, according to the Wiedemann-Franz law. Phonons, so these are vibrations in the lattice of a solid or through liquid. Um, as I'll show in a few minutes, the spectrum of phonons becomes very limited below 100 millikelvin, and scattering due to boundaries uh, is the dominant limitation. So if you have a sample and you have many, many interfaces at low temperatures, it's very hard to get the phonon from the liquid helium uh, through the sample and pull heat away. The less interfaces you have, the better up to a point. You can do something that I'll show from Snell's law that will actually give you better transmission, like an anti-reflective coating on a camera lens. So how do we ensure good thermal, thermal contact for the measurement? Step one is heat sink your wires and everything leading to the low temperature region. Have the sample in a liquid or vapor environment. This is not always possible. Heat capacity, thermal conductivity, you've got to be in a vacuum. Um, minimize the number of interfaces that the heat flow will experience. So what are some ways that things go wrong? So copper is a great way of carrying current and a great way of carrying a lot of heat. So wires need to be heat sunk very well as they come from 300 Kelvin down to whatever low temperature you're trying to achieve. Uh, Kapitza resistance. So this is thermal boundary mismatch between two materials. The phonons between the materials are reflected at the boundary. And again, it becomes very large effect below 100 millikelvin. And you can overcome this with large surface areas. This is what happens with the heat exchangers in a dilution refrigerator. Um, they are able to overcome this by having tremendous surface areas uh, inside. Self-heating. So your measurement will heat your sample to some degree. There are some detection methods where there is no heating, and that's a great way to do a measurement, but that's not going to give you all the information you need on a sample. Um, another important thing to realize, uh, as we were talking about lock-ins yesterday, there's a thing called pump out noise for equipment. Some equipment is better than others, but let's say you hook up a current source to your sample and you say, okay, I'm putting in 10, mil 10 nanoamps. Great, I've got everything accounted for. But for some reason, your electron temperature does not get below 100 millikelvin. So you do this, you do that, you check this, you check that. And after about two days, you put a oscilloscope on the output of the current source and there's all this hash on there. 
So that's what's called pump out noise. So your current source was noisy. It's actually putting unaccounted for current into your sample. So you thought you had 10 nanoamps, when in reality you may have 20 or 30 because you didn't know about this noise going down in there. So those are the kind of things that can bite you in the rear end. Eddy current heating, low resistance metals in rapidly changing fields um, induce a current which dissipates energy in the metal. Um, and levitation. So helium is magnetic and it levitates in a high field, in a high gradient. And uh, shockingly, we have both here at the Magnet Lab. Who knew? So heat seeking wires. Let's go through a, a quick example of this. So if this is 300 Kelvin, our warm end, we have our link um, down to the heat sink at T2. And this is the cold end when, where we're going to attach our experiment. So let's look for some 36 gauge wire, which is kind of beefy. But depending on the experiment you want to do, you may need that. So if your wire is going to be stainless steel, if you wanted to go from 300 to 80 Kelvin here, you'd need about 3 millimeters. And similarly, about 3 millimeters uh, at 4 Kelvin because stainless steel has a pretty high resistance. So manganin, again, similar numbers. It's a high resistance metal. Phosphor bronze has better conductivity, so you get a difference between the 70 or the 80 Kelvin number and the 4 Kelvin number. But let's say you're doing a high current measurement and you want to use copper. So this is where the Wiedemann Franz comes in and really bites you. So if you have an intermediate heat sink at 80 Kelvin, you're going to need about 3 centimeters of wire to heat sink that. If you want to go directly from 300 to 4, you're going to need about 13 centimeters of wire wrapped on a heat sink to make sure that it's cold. And this is important because these wires are directly attached to your experiment. Right? That means if that end is not cold when it attaches to your experiment, you're putting in electrons at some temperature above your bath temperature. So this needs to be as cold as possible if you want your experiment to be at the temperature your thermometer says it is. So Kapitza resistance. This is really only a problem below 100 millikelvin. Um, so I don't know how many of you, how many of you have taken optics at some point? Come on, raise your hands. That's it. How many of you have heard of Snell's Law? Same number of people, right? OK. So if you look at Snell's Law for optics, this also works for phonons because phonons are waves, just like light, There's vibrations. So if we have an interface of liquid helium and copper, we have an incident phonon here. So here's our angle of incidence, our angle of reflection, and our angle of transmission. So this is all undergraduate physics. Using Snell's Law, we can take the sine of the incident over the sine of the transmitted angle. And instead of using the index of refraction, we just use the speed of sound. Right? It's the same physics. So for helium, the speed of sound is 238 meters per second. For copper, the speed of sound is 500 meters per second at low temperatures. So for minimum transmission, so meaning I have an incident phone on, and I just barely want to get it into the copper, that means this angle is 90 degrees. So that means the phone on comes in and just squeaks right along the surface. That's the minimum transmission across the boundary. So let's calculate what the angle would be, how big of a cone to move phonons across that boundary do I have? Because after that, anything else to get to angles that are less than 90 degrees, this angle has to move closer here to normal, right? So that angle, we just solve for the incidence, three degrees or less. That means any phonon that's beyond three degrees is internally reflected back into the liquid helium. So that means most of your phonon spectrum is not available to move heat across that boundary. So that's why at very low temperatures, it's very easy to self-heat, and it's very easy to not cool down a sample at all. So this really becomes an issue at very low temperatures. So Let's do a little uh, real world test. So in our portable dilution refrigerator that's using the resistive magnets, we have a probe thermometer that because of space issues is located about 100 millimeters from where you're doing the experiment. So instead of using a sample, my sample was a calibrated thermometer. And what I did is I kept putting increasing amounts of current into my sample, which is also a thermometer, so I know what its temperature is. And I compared it to what my probe thermometer was saying my experiment temperature was. So I just kept going along, 
increasing my excitation. So you see we get here about 10 to the minus 11 watts, which is not a lot of heat to be putting in. And I start to get about mm, 8 to 10 millikelvin difference. So things are getting worse and worse. At about a nanowatt, I've got 90 millikelvin on my sample, but my uh, probe thermometer still says I'm about 35 millikelvin. So there's two problems here. The first is I don't know what the temperature is, and the second is the physics I'm seeing are not 35 millikelvin physics. So it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. So at this point, I thought things were just going to fall off. But you notice we're now dissipating 10 to the minus 5. The probe thermometer still doesn't show it because I can't move the phonons across the boundary. Right? It's surrounded by this envelope of liquid helium that's not available to move phonons across that interface. So I have this wonderful insulator surrounding my experiment. So at the very end, my sample's sitting at 2 Kelvin in a bath of 50 millikelvin liquid. And this actually happens when people do experiments. And the reason is signal to noise. Right? My signal's buried in here. I keep increasing the current, keep increasing the current until I can see something. But in the process of increasing that current, you're baking your sample. You're no longer at the low temperature of the liquid. All right, so you say, that doesn't matter to me. I'm in helium-3. Kapitza resistance is not an issue. So I'm good, right? Um, and to be fair, I actually thought this as well. So let's do the same experiment. Let's get to the animation. Why did I do that? OK. So the best possible thing you could do if your sample is not a thermometer is have your sample and your thermometer and glue them together, right? You can't get any better than that. That's as good as you can possibly get. Put your, your sample and your thermometer in intimate physical contact. That should give you good indication of what your, your sample temperature actually is. And then just for fun, I include two more thermometers uh, just a short distance away. And some of you have already done this in the practical and seen the effect. So in helium-3, you can see you're getting here these tremendous differences in temperature. And this is with the sample and the thermometer glued together. It doesn't even see it. So you can completely fool yourself that you're doing a physics experiment when all you're doing is making Alka-Seltzer. Literally, you are boiling helium-3 and this becomes important with the, the bubble issue in helium-3 and helium-4. Because what will happen is, because you're generating vapor, you then start excluding all the liquid from around your experiment. And now things just get worse and worse and worse. But you say, Tim, Tim, my sample is only milliohms of resistance. You don't understand. It's not, it's not going to heat. And I say, well, OK. But you have to connect your sample to the outside world. And when you do that, you've got this thing called contact resistance. So some people can make very good contacts, depending on the material. Um, maybe it's milliohms, maybe it's ohms. I just pick 5 ohms as a canonical number. Plus, you also have some finite lead resistance going into your sample. You can't use superconductors at 30 tesla. right? They're no longer superconducting. That's not going to work. So let's say you want to have half a microvolt of signal across your sample. What's going to happen? you're going to end up dissipating right in this area 2 and a half microwatts of heat, which is right there. So you have to understand what's going on with your measurement to understand what's going to happen at low temperatures. These are all things that get folded into the result that you get on the computer screen as you're sweeping the field, as you're sweeping the temperature, right, while you're doing your experiment. So magnetic helium. So helium-3 and helium-4 are diamagnetic. That means they're pushed to lower fields when exposed to a gradient. So let's look at our uh, situation we have in, in a 35 Tesla magnet. Uh, here's our probe. There's a sample holder at the end that's a rotator. We'll say this is our puddle of helium-3. And here's these black lines represent our high field region. So liquids are more dense than gas, so they're more magnetic. So the condition to get bubbles trapped at high fields is when the force due to the magnetic field is greater than the force due to gravity by this following relation. Uh, typically in our magnets, 
This happened, so in general it happens at 21 tesla squared per centimeter. In the resistive magnets, it's around 18 to 20 tesla in those magnets when you cross this condition to get levitation. And literally this is what happens. So if you're generating significant quantities of heat here that can't be carried away uh, uh, with convection through the liquid, then you generate bubbles, and the bubbles just stay there. And the bubble grows and grows and grows and grows. And you'll be sweeping the magnetic field, do, 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 and all of a sudden, wow, I've got a phase transition at 19 Tesla. Amazing. And the, the issue is your thermometer is right up here, so it's still in liquid helium. It says, oh, your temperature is the same. You're doing good. So you ramp up, you ramp back down, and it repeats. And even better, it has hysteresis, so you have a first order transition. So your thesis just got even better. You just saw something that no one else saw. No. What happened was you just lost all your cooling power and your temperature went from half a degree to a degree. And then as you ramped it back down, you got underneath this condition and all the liquid went sploosh right back around your sample. So eddy current heating. So some measurements have to be uh, sample in vacuum. And in order to carry heat, you need high conductivity materials. Eddy current heating is governed by this equation. So you have the resistance, the change uh, in magnetic field squared, uh, the radius to the fourth, and length goes in linearly. So if we have a canonical cylinder of, say, copper, uh, what happens is if you have a changing magnetic field in this direction, you induce a current in this direction. Um, and the way you get around this, you can minimize the outer diameter because the power goes as radius to the fourth, you can minimize your sweep rate. So you don't have to sweep at 10 tesla per minute. So the resistive magnets can sweep very fast. And people are, users are very interested in getting the maximum amount of data in the shortest period of time, but you can just be shooting yourself in the foot. You know, I've gotta get this done, I've gotta go through these angles and these temperatures. You could be heating things up and you're not getting the results that you think you are. Um, but this can also be beneficial. So for the doers that we use in the resistive magnets, the liquid helium tail and liquid nitrogen tail are made of copper for two reasons. Reason one is to short out the bubble problem that occurs at high field. So even though we get a bubble in the helium four tail, the copper remains at four degrees. So we have a four degree surface there so we don't warm up the cryostat that's inside. The second reason is the power supplies, while they're very quiet, are not infinitely quiet. That means there's a little ripple on the magnetic field. That means that's going to be noise in your experiment. By having copper at low temperatures, that acts as a Faraday shield. So it's very high conductivity at low temperatures that actually wipes out that ripple in the magnetic field. So it's conus oscillations. So this is something that can actually happen almost anywhere. Uh, this will happen in superconducting magnet doers. It'll happen doers and resistive magnets. This can happen in your laboratory, in your cryostat. So with Taconis oscillations, you can carry watts of heat. I'm not talking milliwatts, nanowatts, watts. Light bulb amounts of heat. So if you get these in a doer of liquid helium, you can lose all the liquid helium, 50 liters, in about two to three hours. So you fill the thing up, you forget, and you leave part of the transfer line in there, and you come back, you say, where'd all my helium go? It's gone. Everything's warmed up. I've got a leak. Something's wrong with the OVC. Um, no. What happened was you got a thermoacoustic oscillation. And let's see if I can get this to work. So here, I'm going to. So this is the stab for the transfer line. And that's just a rubber stopper on the top. So this is the recovery line here. I don't know if you can hear that. That's water turning to ice. So you see it starting to smoke. That's the boil off increasing. So now watch right here. See that? Those are the tonus oscillations with the flexible membrane of the rubber stopper. Now you see the boil off just going crazy. So as I said, watts of heat. So if that condition had stayed there like that, probably within 40 minutes, 50 liters of helium would have been gone once the liquid level fell below the bottom of the transfer line. This can also happen in probes going into systems, even if they're not going into liquid. That has also happened in the past and happens currently. So safety. So let's look where things can go wrong. 
So cryogenic burns, you can get severe damage to living tissue. Eyes are especially vulnerable. So when you're transferring liquids, just wear safety glasses, okay? Even though you've done it 100 times, you've never had a problem, fittings break, O-rings break, things will spray, save your eye, right? Burns to your face are one thing, but burns to your eyes are very, very hard, if not impossible to fix. Asphyxiation. So the liquid to gas ratio for helium is about 700. If we take a laboratory that's 20 feet by 20 feet by 12 feet, that's about 4,800 cubic feet. You only need 193 liters of liquid helium to displace all the air in that laboratory. That's not a lot of liquid if you have a 250 liter doer of liquid helium sitting there. So two breaths at a 0% oxygen atmosphere result in immediate unconsciousness. It's equivalent to getting hit in the head with a hammer. If you come to a laboratory that you know has cryogens in it and you see somebody on the floor, do not go in that laboratory. Do not think I can hold my breath, walk in there and pull them out. This has been proven multiple times with multiple fatalities. Get, walk back, get somebody with breathing apparatus, or better yet, get a long tool, hook them, and pull them out. Do not walk into that atmosphere. You will die, guaranteed. So. The other thing is we don't need to displace all the air. If we drop the oxygen concentration by 10%, bad things start happening. Judgment's impaired, you start getting dizzy. Um, if you're on a ladder, you'll fall. So embrittlement, not all materials are suitable for use at low temperatures. Thumb, some things will fracture. It's a very strong material at room temperature, but at four Kelvin, it basically turns into glass and it'll shatter and come apart. Um, pressure buildup, high pressure gas stores great amounts of energy. And beware of solid air condensed inside the vacuum can of a doer if it's been cold for long periods of time. And oxygen enrichment on cold surfaces. So if you're transferring liquid nitrogen through a tube that's not insulated, you will condense a mixture of 50% nitrogen and 50% oxygen on that tube, and it starts dripping. If it's dripping on something like an oily rag, it can spontaneously combust. And now you've got the wonder of fire and cryogenics together in the same laboratory, and your advisor is just happy as can be with dealing with the administration from that. So let's look at small scale pressure buildup. If I have 20 cc's of helium-4 liquid, that's about 13 liters of gas when you warm it to 300 Kelvin. If I hold the volume constant, the pressure goes from atmosphere to 71 bar. That's 1,000 PSI. Um, that's painful. So when your experiment warms up, the gas will find a way to escape. A planned release, a vent valve, a pressure relief valve is better than the materials test approach. So this was a cryostat that had a leak uh, into a vacuum space. There was no way for the gas to get out when the thing was pulled up to room temperature. So it imploded. Unfortunately, a student's thesis was inside this part. And there's nothing like seeing a technician go at the end of the probe with your thesis on it with a Dremel tool, right? That's a moment where your stomach starts churning and getting in knots. So this is something that you want to plan for. And as I said, passive pressure reliefs allow the system and the researcher to survive unforeseen operation hazards. So what happens when it's a large scale pressure buildup? So this used to be a dilution refrigerator in a magnet, in a doer. This was the plate holding it to the floor. So the bolts that attached the dilution refrigerator to the top plate were ripped out. The concrete anchor holding this to the floor was pulled out of the concrete along with a chunk of concrete. So that tells you right away there's a lot of energy that happened in this event. You can see here, these are called helicoils that are put inside a threaded hole to provide additional holding power for a bolt. Those were completely ripped out of the aluminum. So during this incident, we estimated there were about 50 liters of liquid helium inside the doer. It's about 43,000 liters of gas when this happened. So what happened to the doer? So this is the outer vacuum can. The bottom of the doer was blown off. Okay, we did not cut that off. That was blown off when it came apart. This was a weld in the aluminum can that was basically like a zipper on a jacket. It just unzipped. And you can see here at the top where it just kept going into the metal. and just completely opened this thing up. So if this happens when you're standing over it, that's a very bad thing. So what I want to impress on you is that cryogenics are great. They do a lot for our research, but you have to respect it. Anytime you're around these things, 
you're near a bomb, you're near a source of energy, you're near a cannon, you have to treat it like that and you have to be aware of it. Even if everything looks very safe, even if it's built by a manufacturer, mistakes are made, things get altered, you have to pay attention to this stuff. All right, so now that I've frightened you sufficiently, uh, let's talk about some of the sample environments. So sample in vacuum, high thermal conductivity cold fingers. Um, this is very useful for specific heat, thermal conductivity and optical measurements. Well-defined thermal path, no liquid or gas to interfere with the optical beam um, or heat decay. So cons, it's more difficult to cool the sample. Self-heating is an issue, a lot more conducting metal, eddy current heating. So a good example of this is the Cell 5 uh, split helix system. So this is a top-loading cryogenic system. It can go from 5K to 300 Kelvin. This is a uh, split coil magnet. So there is optical access right there, and this is looking through the optical port right here. You have lasers and spectrometers surrounding this. So you can do high-speed real space optics with this system. This is 25 Tesla. There is no other magnet like this in the world. So sample in liquid. The sample is immersed directly into the cryogenic fluid, helium-3 or helium-4. Great contact, um, poorly defined thermal path, not suitable for specific heat measurements. This is an example. Um, you'll see a version of this in cell nine, Thursday and Friday for the practical. Um, very quick to load and unload a probe. Uh, good temperature stability and good temperature range. So very quickly moving through, thermometers for high field. So we use Cernox sensors, uh, ruthenium oxide sensors from 1.5 to 10 millikelvin. Uh, and we use, can use capacitance thermometers, which are nominally field insensitive, um, but their temperature sensitivity falls below 500 millikelvin. Essentially, it flattens out into a bowl. Um, and they drift, and they cannot be calibrated. Every time you cool one of these things down, the capacitance versus temperature relation is different. So that you then have to recalibrate it at zero field with a resistance thermometer to use it. Vapor pressure can also be used. That is field independent. But since you're not measuring locally, you're not sensitive to local heating effects. So let's look at Cernox sensors. This is some data taken years ago by Bruce Brandt. So at 2 Kelvin, going up to about 33 Tesla, you can see you get a pretty dramatic increase in the magneto resistance, uh, delta R over R of 15%. So that means you're going to get a very large apparent temperature change uh, in the sensor. So that's not telling you the true temperature at, look at the, the sample position. The advantages are these are easy to use, wide temperature range, and you can calibrate the magneto resistance, which we are working on right now. This was a set of data produced in SCM2 to do that very thing. The disadvantage is the significant magneto resistance, for instance, at 250 millikelvin, you get about 100% magneto resistance. So if you start at 250 millikelvin and sweep to 18, the thermometer says you're at half a degree, even though you're not. Ruthenium oxide is very sensitive from 1.5 Kelvin to 10 millikelvin. Um, it can also be calibrated in field. As you get to lower and lower temperatures, the magneto resistance gets larger, and you get some weak localization effects at low fields, which are very difficult to control through, um, as I said right there. Um, it is possible to calibrate the magneto resistance, and that, again, is something that we're working on right now. So some parts of the road are what we call paved. Um, so I'm going to borrow this statement from Al Migliori. So six months in the lab can save you six hours in the library. Um, it's great to be in the lab. It's great to discover new things. However, you're not the first scientist. Um, many others have come before us. As Ryan said, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. So just do some reading. You can learn a lot, and you can save a lot of time. So probe design, uh, functionality, what's it supposed to do? So Let's say this is where we want to do our experiment. This is actually a plastic high pressure cell where we're measuring the pressure. So we've got an optical fiber going to it, illuminated by a laser. Laser. So what is the temperature range we want to do? Is it going to be in liquid or vacuum? How high of a magnetic field are we going in? How many wires do we need? Do we need motion? Optical access. How much space do I need for the experiment? So when you're designing a probe, this is where everything starts. So you have to design this first because everything else serves that, right? This is the most valuable real estate at the Magnet Lab. This is field center. So you want to get the most you can out of this space. So the Einstein constraint is something that I live by. Everything should be kept as simple as possible, but no simpler. So simplification, just to simplify, 
will lead you down a path that is not going to be productive. So this is one example from my past where I designed a probe head to be functional, but the design of it was really an ass pain. The machining of it was an ass pain. The machinists are looking at me, why, God, why are you doing this to us? Um, but in terms of its ability as to be used as a scientific instrument, it's very useful, right? And the thing I always point to is this. How many people think this was easy to design? Nobody. How many people find this easy to use? Everybody. So typically what you'll find in mechanical design is the ease of use is inversely proportional to the ease of design. So don't be surprised if during the design you spend a lot of time figuring this stuff out and get frustrated. That's fine. CAD programs are really easy to erase lines and redo stuff. Once you get the part made by the machine shop and then you come back again to have it remade, you start getting the stink eye. And if you come back a third time, they're like, oh yeah, we've got a place for you in the queue. It's somewhere way at the back. So again, simple to use does not equal easy to design. And this leads me to modularity. So here we have a flat tire. So when you have a flat tire, do you buy a new car? How many people do that? Okay, so what do you do when you have a flat tire? What's the operation? Change the tire. How do you change the tire? Jack up the car, what's next? Come on, I need students. Okay, you take off the, the tire in the rim. How do you take off the tire? What allows you to do that? You have a wrench. So what this is, this is a flange, right? A flange allows you to take off the part that's broken, fix it, or put a new part on, right? Flanges are wonderful things. In fact, I'm gonna say flanges are your friend. So this was a probe made for some infrared research years ago where there is no there are no flanges. This was all hard soldered at the top, which you can't see because it's covered in what's known as Q-wax or more colloquially as bear or monkey shit. <laughs> it had a leak, and because of how it was designed and assembled, there was no way to fix that leak. So in order to get through a week of magnet time, they basically silly putty the top of it. It still leaked. The results were not so great. So it was a wasted week of magnet time. This whole thing was junked. You look at the man hours, you look at the materials, all of that is wasted. If things had been flanged and modular, you can find the offending part, fix the offending part, and go back and do your research. So durability. Um, given my last name, I'm proud to say that Murphy's Laws predate Newton's Laws. Um, if you build it, you're gonna fix it. If you build it and your lab mate uses it, you will definitely fix it. Um, when you build something, test the finished product. Don't build something and then put your thesis in it to do your research. Ideally, you shouldn't know what's gonna happen with your thesis, that's an unknown. Put something known in there that you know how it's gonna respond so you can test and see what the parameters of that system are. Don't assume that it's gonna work um, because it's not and definitely don't be this guy in the laboratory. If you break someone else's stuff, try to fix it, offer to help fix it. You may not be able to fix it, but at least make the offer. So conclusions, so details are what I call the evil flying monkeys of low temperature, high field measurements. Um, the user systems at the mag lab, we've taken care of a lot of these, but we rely on you to understand your measurement and ensure that the results are correct. We're not doing your thesis. We're not experts in topological insulators necessarily or graphene, you are, you're supposed to be. Um, successful design should reflect functionality, simplicity, modularity, and durability and be safe and have fun. That's it. Any questions? I think I'm massively over. Okay, so a couple quick questions. Yeah. So like what you do when you say you're not going to spend money. Mm-hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. And the way we say it is that we can access that information, but still be careful how we don't run into problems, even though we think it's there. But the opinion of some people is that it's really easy. Yeah. So, so that's why we don't make the rotator out of copper. It's made of brass. So that has higher conductivity. And it doesn't suffer nuclear demagnetization at low temperatures and high fields. Um, the other thing we've done is we'll actually put a Cernox or ruthenium oxide at field center 
and simulate an experiment just to see how bad things get. So when you're running, if the user support research faculty says, hey, stay below this ramp rate, they're telling you from experience, stay below that ramp rate. Um, so a lot of this envelope has already been whittled down. And we can give you an idea that if you stay in here, your temperature is going to be stable and you'll be at a low temperature. In the dilution refrigerator, the rotator is actually plastic. So there's no eddy current heating going on there at all. But typically, that's going to be a very small chunk of material. So it, it's not going to eddy current heat. Well, so if you're on a cantilever measuring magnetization, then you're fine. If you're measuring Shubnikov to Haas, you would have to have micro-ohm contacts in order for that to work at milliamps of current. Well, no, it's not just the gold wires. It's the contact resistance between the wire and the material. Right, that's a series resistance in the measurement. Time for one, one more. Yeah. Yes, sure. Um, so there are ways to compensate that. That becomes especially critical if you're doing like scanning probe microscopy. We don't do that here yet, uh, thank God. Um, but there are designs to the cryostat where you can minimize the boiling and how the boiling nucleates and then how the bubbles travel through the liquid. Um, how the 1K pot operates will affect STM. So there's uh, STM up at NIST. Hong Wu has a lot of experience with this. Um, and the design of the 1K pot was such that it minimized the vibration from the boiling of liquid inside the 1K pot, because that can affect uh, operation of a scanning probe microscope as well. Yeah, so for what we do out here, you will never see the boiling of the cryogens. It never shows up, right? You're, you're centimeters away from a magnet that's sitting at 40,000 amps with 2,000 gallons per minute of water rushing through it. Uh, yeah, it, it just doesn't exist, okay?